Welcome back to the Manage to Win podcast. I'm glad to have you here. We've got a great conversation coming up. Before we get there, please check out habitly.com. We actually kind of refer to soft skills actually directly in the podcast today, but Habitly is all about learning those soft skills. How do you work effectively together, avoid confrontation, resolve it, set goals and achieve them, communicate well, lots of other things there. Very valuable, seven days free. You can't go wrong. Habitly.com. Today's podcast discussion is with Richard Moran. He's a PhD. He wrote a book called Never Say Whatever, How Small Decisions Make a Big Difference. Eh, whatever. But we have a good conversation. This is important. Think about it. There's a lot going on in our lives where we may not use the word whatever, but we're actually blowing off decisions that we need to make professionally and personally. Richard has some great comments, some great insights. Let's dive in. Richard, you wrote a book called Never Say Whatever, and uh, you don't know this coming out of the podcast, but I actually have told people whatever is a four-letter word. So I think you and I are on the same page, but what drove you to write this book? Actually, I, I'm happy that you said that because uh, whatever is often compared to the F word. It has so many uses. <laughs> and so I... To me, the book is like a fingernail on a blackboard. When there were blackboards, it is the most annoying word in the in the world. And um, people, a lot of people think, well, that's for valley girls or for you know people who don't you know young women in Southern California. And it's totally not true. And I'm, I just can't believe I use the word totally when talking about Southern California <laughs> girls. But um, I I have found that. Everyone uses the word whatever when it comes to small decisions. And what I'm really trying to do is let people know that small decisions matter because there's not that many big decisions in our lives. And so make them and stop saying the word whatever. So I am, my goal in life is to put an earwig in everybody's ear. You know, it, the most irritating thing in the world when you hear it, you just, it's like the, uh, jingle for the Cars for Kids commercial that just makes you cringe. And I want people to cringe when they hear the word whatever. So I started that. And then it turns out it's a it's a topic about decision making, really. And and it's really resonating with people. So when you lead that to, by the way, I agree, a lot of people use whatever to kind of say, you know, buzz off or F off or whatever. Yeah. But um, I, I really like that you've linked it to decision making because I think in our digital society where we're under assault from social media and all kinds of media, I think people have really set critical thinking aside or they've never learned it. And so mm -hmm. they're tending to make decisions based on partial information that's then man been manipulated to you know, pitch one viewpoint or another. And um, talk to me, dive in a little bit deeper here on how this affects people's decision-making. Well, one of the things that I, I interviewed a lot of people for the book and um, the word whatever was always illegal in our family. So it was never something that I pride myself on not doing it. But I think you're right, David, that after COVID and with all the strife in politics and division, people give up. It's easy to, whatever can be a, I am helpless, I am resigned kind of attitude, or I don't, I don't give a dang attitude. And what I'm trying to convey is, no, that's, that's not okay. You need to care about these small decisions. And one of the, one of the things I found is that Leaders are very good at making decisions, which is probably very obvious. But the small decisions mean when mean that if you don't make them, you're not going to get what you want ever. There's some researchers at Cornell did a study about lunch. May not sound like a big thing, but when you go out to lunch with a colleague, you're making about 200 decisions: where to go, where to sit whole wheat, sourdough, lettuce and tomato, mayo, mustard, the list can go on. And every time you say whatever, 
you're likely to not get the sandwich that you want. And I use that metaphorically just to show people that they they pile up. And every time you say whatever, it the decisions, whether it's be about voting, lots of times people say, I don't like anybody, whatever. Well, no, you have to pick one. And so I'm trying to, there's a malaise. Post-COVID, there's a malaise and people are feeling bad and helpless. And I'm trying to pump them up and say, when you wake up in the morning, don't wake up and say, oh, it's going to be, I don't feel like doing anything today, whatever. No, get up in the morning and say, I'm, I'm making the choice to have a good day. Simple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember my mother used to say the early bird gets the worm and I have no idea where that phrase came from, <laughs> but I'm struck in what you're saying. It seems like there, there's an old saying in faith circles that um, evil doesn't have to convince you that it's right. Evil just has to get you busy. And when you're too busy, then you won't take the time to think mm -hmm. and you'll yeah. go with the flow. Well, and I think to your earlier comment, there is a false sense of activity that people have and people are busy, 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 but to what end? What, what, why are, why are we so busy? Yeah. I like to talk about, and this is at the most basic level that I found from leaders and successful people. And that is that they are, it's a, it's a buzzword now, but it's the, the word is intentional. And I'll, I'll put it into more, uh, I'll bring it down as low as I can that, and that is that if you know what your intent is, your actions and your decisions are clear. So in a, in a simple way, if, you, if your intent is to lose weight, you act like you're on a diet and you make decisions about that. If your intent is to stay married, you act like you are married and you make decisions about that. If your intent is to try to stay in shape, you take the stairs, you make the decision to take the stairs and not the elevator. And one of the one of the people that I interviewed for the book was a guy in Kansas who's both a lawyer and a priest, and he has a personal mission statement that clarifies his intent. And I'm I'm saying it lightly, but it's really hard to clarify your intent, whether you're an organization or a leader. It's hard. It's hard to clarify your intent. But if you it do it, takes. Yeah. if you do it, then your actions are clear. Well, that's right. And, and so it's interesting to me, at least my thought is, that to clarify your intent takes removing the distractions and having what I call some sanctuary time where you're not distracted by the phone or email or even people. And you can really think it through and then bounce it off some people and refine it. But then once you've done that, which is great, you still then have to go back to it daily or at least weekly, to remind yourself, because I, I, you're using the word intent, but it sounds like you're actually defining who you are or who you want to be type of thing. Yeah. It goes deeper, it, doesn't it? It does. And that's, that's the second total concept of the book, and that is those who are good at making decisions are self-aware. Yeah. So, and it's sort of the numerator and a denominator. If your intent is clear and you're self-aware, then you can make decisions. And a, a good example I used is um, I, I consider myself self-aware. And as a CEO, I recognized, and all the reviews I've ever had have pointed this out to me. There's no surprise. I'm good at relationships. I'm good at selling. I'm good at communicating. I'm terrible at the details. I'm terrible at the spreadsheets. Don't so as a CEO. I was self-aware enough to know that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I need to get people around me who can, and then yeah. I could make decisions based based on that. So yeah. there's there's this self-awareness and sort of self-awareness is all about telling yourself the truth about what you're good at, what you're not, and not taking that, not going to law school if you know you're not going to like it. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people have done that. So. And it may not be the use of the word whatever, but it is going with the flow or procrastinating on decisions that need to be made, isn't it? It is. And it could be, you know, whatever is sort of a surrogate for shrugging your shoulders or 
you're rolling your eyes or giving the middle finger, it can it's a surrogate for a lot of different things. But it is also, I think we're suffering from decision fatigue right now in the world. And they pile up. And then sometimes when there's a big pile of decisions, that's when we can say whatever as well, which still still doesn't work. But it's it can be procre- a good example I use is every day. I think for most of your listeners and for you, I, I wake up and I see a hundred emails or more, and they could be from the Nigerian prince or they could be from somebody I care about, and I have to make a decision about every single one of those. Yeah. And I, a, a whatever decision is not a decision. It's it's not it's not going to get me. It's not going to move me forward through the day. Yeah, yeah, and. Um... It strikes me also that uh, when you have that identity, then you're going to hold yourself in check. It's like I, I know some people that view themselves as athletes. So it's like, okay, I'm I'm not going to eat ice cream before I go to bed. You know, I'm not going to go to bed with that in my stomach. Now, the, that athlete may have ice cream in the afternoon, mm-hmm. you know, but but they're going to time certain things. They're going to do certain things because they feel that's who they are. Um, yeah. You know, a, a prime example that strikes me with the whatever that you've probably seen a lot is managers, uh, leaders of all levels, who delay addressing a serious issue with an employee in a way that brings about change or termination. Mm-hmm. So they have people on their team who are not performing up to the level they want. And I'm not talking it lasts weeks. It, it often lasts six months, a year, or multiple years. Because they're saying basically, whatever, you know, I'll, 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 it's easier to have them there than to go to the trouble to fill it with someone else. Yeah, and it can be a plague in the organization because that uh, behavior is modeled. It's if a manager or leader is not making decisions, no one is going to make decisions. And why, why make decisions? Because that means that I can get blamed for something. Or, you know, there's, there's a downside to making, there's risks in making decisions. And those leaders and managers who don't make decisions often are risk averse and they're wishy-washy. And I hope that they don't last long. You know, can you imagine, <laughs> I mean, imagine Steve Jobs saying whatever, or, yeah. or I mean, yeah, no, I mean, name, name, name a leader that we had, Warren Buffett, I mean, Bill Gates. I mean, I don't know, but imagine a leader that we admire saying whatever. No, one of the one of the interviews I did for the book that I so enjoyed was a guy named Michael Huerta, and Michael had been the administrator, the the king of the Federal Aviation Administration. He had one hundred and sixty thousand air traffic controllers working for him. So I talked to him about the word. He's. It took him a while. He said, "I can't imagine." Can you imagine an air, a pilot talking to an air traffic controller and should I runway left or runway right? And the, whatever. No, no. <laughs> um, and he also talked about how part of, part of, I think, what you're talking about, David, is measures also. And he said that they had a very simple measure at the FAA, and that was did the same number of planes land that day that took off that day? And that was a simple measure. And if they, and if the answer was yes, it was a good day. If the answer was no, it was a terrible day. And I think measures and accountability are a big part of what we're talking about in whatever as well. Well, I noticed in chapter five called leaders, managers, and everyone else, you actually say the road to success is paved with risk. Mm-hmm. And so talk to me about how do you how do you help someone who's adverse to risk? So they're an analytical, they're detail oriented, or they're just they're process oriented. They just felt Stuck. like change, and it, you know. So on the on the analytical detail oriented person, they might be a perfectionist. So it's like I don't want to take a risk if it's working. The the other person who's really process oriented, very settled in, comfortable on the disc scale would be a high S. Um, you know, they just don't like change. Why should I change? It's working. Yeah, yeah. How do you get them to stop saying whatever? Yeah. One of the one of the things I found and it was consistent is that the larger the organization, the more likely it is that there's whatever's in the organization. Uh, yeah, because you're just 
why bother? You're you're stuck. Um, but when it comes to risk, um, one of the things that someone that I interviewed pointed out to me was that um, there almost is always three different options for any leader. Lots of leaders will say, oh, I have so many options that I can't choose. The truth is there's three. And the first door number one is as is. No change, nothing, nothing will go. It is rare that that's acceptable in an organization. That's a rare, if you're not moving forward, then you're stuck and you're moving backward. So as is, is not usually an option. Option door number three, way out here, is go crazy, fire everybody, change everything, do this, do that, burn the place down, start all over. People don't choose that either. So now we're in door number two and all of its nuances. And I think as we look at the options to change and how that can be reflected in our choices, that's where the nub, that's where the nub is. And that's how you get people out of saying, whatever, we don't need to change anything. The answer to to that always is yes, we'd always need to change something. In fact, when you're being successful, it's always the best time to change something. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I kind of came up with a model that I call CRT, which is uh low cost, low amount of resources, low amount of time. So it you can implement that lean startup model. Yeah. Where you where you test something, you just do a piece of it. Well, if you say we don't have to change, then can we change this one thing? I think this might make a difference. Yeah. Or can we change part of it and see and try to help those people learn how change is more positive? I don't think there's training on that. There isn't. And, and I talk about that, that there's, you know, we can take, you know, sophisticated college classes on organic chemistry and calculus three, but nowhere is there any decision-making classes taught, even in high school. It's just not, not part of the curriculum. And it's, it's a shame. Well, and the problem is now, uh, wherever we, we, our audience is on the political spectrum, is if we're going to be honest, a lot of schools now are teaching what to think instead of how to think. And when we'd be such a stronger nation if we were teaching, here's how, what critical thinking is. Here's how you line up the facts. Yeah. Here's how you figure out the outcomes. Now you come to the decision. And let's have, and then teach healthy debate. Yeah. Versus yeah. bullying that we have now. I mean, where would we be if we taught how to be a team member, how to be a leader, how to set and achieve goals, those soft skills instead of a lot of the stuff? I mean, I've got one of my kids learning calculus. They're never going to use calculus. No. Now, for the kid who needs it, that's wonderful. Let's do the best in the world. Yeah. But, you know, the, the soft skills of how to get together and work it out and get through things. Yeah. One of the things that's emerged in it, it's related to what you're discussing is, and I'm a big believer because I flunked calculus twice. I'd still be a sophomore if they didn't change the general education requirements. But one of the things that's happening now is that people are being encouraged to go to their strengths, develop your strengths more, yeah. and don't suffer trying to fix your weaknesses because I know I'm never going to be good at calculus and I'll never use it. But I think I'm a pretty good writer. So how can I develop those skills as a writer? Yeah. And I think that's that's a pivot that's happening now in the world. It doesn't mean I, you know, I, I still use algebra every day. It's not like algebra isn't useful, but I think we need to make it's part of that self awareness that we talked about earlier. That being self aware of what you're good at and what you're not good at really helps you make decisions. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. One of my favorite stories is when Tiger Woods, after starting and winning tournament after tournament, hit a slump, when worked with his coach. And, uh, you know, I asked my, my clients, how much, of their, how much of that time do you think they spend on his strengths versus weaknesses? And then they answer. And then I say, well, what I read was they spent 80% of their time on his strengths, yeah, which was long game and putting. And then they took 20%, which was short game and sand traps, I think. And kind of like your algebra analysis, they just made it so it wouldn't hurt them. You yeah. wouldn't lose strokes there. They weren't going to make them the best in those areas. But if we can help people learn what they need to balance their checkbook and and do the other things they might need math-wise, but not take them to the higher level, but build out those other strengths and soft skills of how to work together and get along and talk about things, it it would be huge. That's a great that's a great metaphor. I I like that. So I I and it but it takes 
part of what you're also talking about is taking the risk to make the decision to work on your strengths because there's a risk not knowing the calculus. Maybe I will use it someday. No, you're not going to use it, but um, but there's a risk in in so doing. Tiger took a risk that to work on his strengths. Yeah, but I, I would say that in the in the algebra versus calculus realm, most people don't want to do calculus who are lousy at it. Like me, I I flunked it in first year of college, and but if they can be aware, just like you mentioned, you were a CEO, and you weren't good with the numbers. So what you do you did, you were aware of it, and you got people you could trust with boundaries. By the way, I noticed in your chapter four, you've got um, the work whatevers, accountability is a cure. So you structured, and if you can teach people to structure some accountability that's done in a healthy way, so that they have someone else to do this this other area that's not their strength, but they also know how to evaluate it. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, people, people, as I've talked about the book, I've noticed that people dodge accountability a little bit. Like, I'm not in charge of anything, so I'm not accountable. And that's a whatever. That's a big whatever. Yeah. And, and because all of us, you can be the CEO of IBM uh, or a big organization, but all of us are accountable to something. And it could be your, your family. It could be your church group. It could be your bowling league. But at the most basic, basic, basic level, you're accountable to yourself. Yeah. You are in charge of yourself. And every time you say whatever, you're you're blowing off that accountability. Yeah, and it goes back to um, basically defining who you want to be or your intent, mm -hmm. like you brought up. If you don't have that defined, it gets really easy yeah. then to kind of blow it off in, with the whatevers. But if you yeah. have it, if you've, if you define that, then it's like, well, this isn't the person I am or I want to be. I yeah. need to take some action here, even if it's a small step. And it matters. It, all of this matters. I mean, I had a boss once uh, when when everybody wore ties. He 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 gave a. He would say, if you showed up at the office with a tie that had a stain on it, he'd say, you need to throw that tie away. Stains don't come out of ties, and you know, stock, ties are expensive, and. I remember a week later or so, I wore the same tie, thinking, whatever, nobody will ever notice it. So my boss came around with scissors and cut off my tie because he was so dramatically telling me, you can't say whatever. People notice that take that stain on your tie. So I never wore it again, obviously, but it was a good metaphor and a good lesson that when you say whatever, maybe nobody will notice, maybe it doesn't matter. The answer is usually that's not true. It does matter. I, I'm curious, Richard. What is a story that you have of someone who has read your book or talked to you about this concept, and it was a two by four across the forehead, and this is how they were before, and and now they've been able to make this progress. Well, one of the as you in a book launch, as you know, you do a lot of interviews and. Sometimes they're with thoughtful people who are smart like you, and sometimes it's somebody, you know, a shock jock radio host in, you know, Syracuse who doesn't, you know, just looks at the book, you know, as I come on the air and I'm scheduled in between, you know, Ted Nugent and, and somebody, some other crazy people. Yeah. And, and I had, you know, just two weeks ago, a, a shock shock radio voice said, you've changed my life. I say this all the time and I didn't know that I was conveying the message that I'm a loser and that these are all important decisions. And so, and it's happened, it's, hap it hap it's happening every day, actually. I, the book has, has hit a nerve. The book has hit a nerve in the world right now. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it because I'm really worried about our country. Mm -hmm. And one of the, if you kind of, look at the different pieces of the puzzle of how the country's falling apart. I think you've hit one of the pieces. Yet, yeah. you know, we every four years we look for someone to elect as president that we can believe in. And every four years we're disappointed. Surprisingly more, it seems like every four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um there's so much whatever going on in our yeah. government. And it's just falling apart. I I think it's great that you're you're getting this going. Yeah. Well thanks. I'm I'm uh Taking it upon myself, I am the evangelist for never say whatever. 
That's yeah. That's my intent. So my decisions, my actions are based on that right now. I love it. I think it's a high bar. I think it's a healthy bar. And um, I, I wish you all the success in the world. Hey, Richard, if people want to learn more, I mean, they can get your book on Amazon or, or wherever, but yeah, yeah book is wherever, not whatever. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, the only the only good usage of whatever, as I've learned, is that uh, when someone says, I love you and I want to win your affections, whatever it takes. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, I have a website. It's richardmoran.com. I, I respond to people on LinkedIn. It's, I'm easy to find. And, uh, and I hope that uh, if I can help people overcome their, this malady of whatever, I'm happy to be, be accessible. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I think this is great for business. I think it's great in people's personal life. And I think, as I mentioned, I think it's Thanks. one of the pieces of the puzzle for our nation to, to turn this ship around. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, David. It's been fun. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Appreciate you making time to be here. I hope you enjoyed the insights from Richard and check out his book, Never Say Whatever. I thought it was great and I'm enjoying the book myself. So leave us a comment, leave us a rating. We'd really appreciate it. Subscribe for this episode to somebody else that could use these insights. That would be great. Please check out Habitly.com, our sponsor, if you want to improve some of your behaviors, your habits, to be the best you can be. And, you know, stay tuned. We've got more great guests coming, but bye for now.